Peter McDonald, who is the William Holland Wilmer Chairman of Ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute. And he's going to help set the stage by describing the importance of clinician scientists to ophthalmology, something that I know he's thought uh, very carefully and very deeply about. Peter, thanks for being here. Tom and Cindy, thank you for organizing today. And thanks for, uh, to all of you who joined us, especially you West Coasters uh, that have gotten up early to be part of um, what, what I hope will be uh, a program that will be very helpful to you uh, young clinician scientists. Uh, at departments like mine, uh, we believe you're the future of our field and uh, the success of academic ophthalmology depends upon your success. And I wanted to give a little perspective from the uh, view of my department and my own personal experience as to uh, why uh, you should be hopefully encouraged and um, excited about the, the work that you're, uh, the path that your career is taking. Our founder, um, if you read the peer-reviewed literature and go on PubMed and look up physician scientists, you will see a distressingly large number of articles like this one, the physician scientist, an endangered breed, question mark, the vanishing physician scientist, another one, the vanishing physician scientist, a critical review and analysis where we're told that uh, uh, it's not really possible for clinician scientists to compete for grants with their PhD track peers. And uh, here's, uh, turns out COVID made it even worse, the endangered physician scientist and COVID-19. So there, there's uh, so much um, similarity in terms of the, uh, the titles and the verbiage used in these articles that I would not blame someone considering going down the pathway of becoming a clinician scientist as thinking they're making a big mistake that uh, I, and I've actually had people tell me the clinician scientist is going the way of the dinosaur. And I have had department chairs, friends of mine who I know who are uh, not uh, unintelligent people tell me that they would never hire a clinician scientist because in their view, um, a clinician scientist cannot compete with the full-time a PhD basic scientist for uh, competitive grant funding. So um, <clears throat> if you're a K awardee on this call, you may be thinking, and a clinician scientist, you may be asking yourself whether you made a mistake. And I would like to strongly, strongly send the message that departments like Wilmer, uh, and there are, as you know, a number of them around the country, we're, we're all in on the idea of uh, that clinician scientists underpin the future of us. Uh, Dr. Harry Quigley, who is the A. Edward Maumini Professor of Ophthalmology here at the Wilmer Eye Institute. Uh, many of you probably already know him or know of him. He's for many years run a very successful clinical and translational science laboratory research program and has the, my, to my understanding, the longest continually funded R01 uh, at the National Eye Institute. In addition, he was the inaugural PI of the Wilmer K-12 program, which was the first K-12 program funded by the NEI. And so he's gonna be giving us some background on uh, the program here. Thanks, Harry. Well, thanks very much, Tom. And I wanna, of course, uh, acknowledge Jim Handa, who's now the co-PI for our K-12 program at Wilmer which began back when it was called K-11. The first of those, to our knowledge, was in 1987. Uh, and it may have been Jonathan Javitt, who uh, is uh, uh, still actively uh, pushing for clinician scientists, especially at Wilmer, and we'll probably hear about more about that later. This just happens to be the, the, uh, the five-year refunding of the K-12 program at Wilmer. But uh, simply to give you an idea, we've had 48 Wilmer K scholars uh, under K mentored programs. 31 of the 38 who completed training remain in academic research related or research intensive practice. So if you believe the articles Peter showed you that this is a dinosaur 
uh, kind of a behavior. These are people who are having successful careers. 24 or 69% of our graduates have achieved their first R-level funding or the equivalent of that. And actually, there's an article that uh, in 2013 said that that rate was 13% among all K uh, graduates from the NEI. So what Dr. Agarwal's just shown you is a dramatic improvement in our funding by K awardees. And our, our group is at least that good, if not better. Of those K awardees who completed training more than five years ago from our team, 42% of those who got an original R01 had achieved a second or renewal R01. So this is not just getting lucky for your first grant, this is a life process. We have had 11 of our 38 past scholars who are women, and now the numbers are 50% of the last group that we've had over the last five years. Uh, and because the K-12 program now mandates that you can be on the K-12 for three years, but must then transition to either a K-08 or a K-23, the transition rate becomes a very important thing. And during our most, most recent four years of funding, uh, all of those who are on our K-12 have moved to individual K-08 or K-23s in order to continue that award time. The values of this program, the K-12 program, over or in addition to the KOA K-23, is that it provides an infrastructure within a department where other Ks can fit into an ongoing system. Uh, we have a department-based committee for the oversight of all of the Ks, whether they're individuals or under the K-12. But the K-12 allows us to plan ahead. So if someone is asking for a, a, an application to be a new faculty member in July, we could, with a K-12, and for those departments that are that have joined us here, Josh Denayev and Ivan O and uh, uh, others, they can say in December, okay, we know you're, no, you're on a K because we have a slot in our K-12 for you, and that takes the worry out of being close, as opposed to waiting until literally the month before uh, to find out that you've been awarded the K. I think it also, therefore, allows a lot of flexibility in planning faculty development for chairpersons. For our particular program, and we'll probably talk about this in the, in the discussion, uh, we ask that applicants actually write a full K proposal in order to be considered for our K-12. We think that shows a commitment on the part of uh, each person. It means that they are already uh, have a, a well-planned mentored training program. Each of those applications, our internal committee runs through a rigorous NIH style review. So we pretty much already know what a study section might say if it is and will be, and they all are submitted for a K08 or K23, even when they're uh, placed on the K12 here. Uh, we've had several applicants who in whom we didn't have enough spots for a K person, the two slots in our K12. Uh, that are available at any given time were filled. And so those get their application reviewed and go straight to uh, successfully getting the K08 or K23. Wilmer now has seven K awardees on individual and K12 uh, positions. Of our faculty, we have 200 and some odd faculty at Wilmer, 90 of them are identified as potential primary or co-mentors for a K program and 34 of our faculty have already served as a mentor. And I think that's that's something that larger departments need to work on if they don't uh, already have that as something that's an important part of their faculty culture. We have the collaborative possibilities through Johns Hopkins Medicine. And I would recommend that anyone who's writing a mentored training program have a team of mentors, not just one, one of those should be a clinician scientist, one potentially a basic scientist, and one of those two or another person should be a non-ophthalmic based scientist to add expertise in particular scientific areas to the kind of work that's going to go on in the mentored training. We typically <clears throat> let, uh, with the permission of a past awardee, each applicant see a K application because it's a daunting process to look at the NIH uh, form and say, oh my goodness, could I possibly fill this thing out? But if you see what one actually looks like, it's a lot easier to then say, oh, well, I understand what I should be doing. 
Uh, I assume we're going to be talking about our rising assistant professorships, which are endowed positions for assistant professors at Wilmer. And I'll mention just now before we get into the further things that we do an annual review. The committee looks at every mentor mentorship team and make sure that the maximum opportunities are being taken advantage of, as well as looking for problems. And believe me, problems do come up and need to be uh, worked on. Uh, there are issues of science not going the way one originally thought. There are issues of ownership of process and uh, which, which work should I be doing. And to have a faculty committee that's uh, helping out is extremely useful. And maybe, Jim, Handa, if you have anything else that you'd like to add about the Wilmer program, I don't put you on the spot. I'm not sure that you thought we were going to do this, but anything you want to add that I haven't mentioned? Uh, no, Harry, and in, in, in my talk, I'll cover one other aspect. So I think uh, what you did is great summary. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jim Handa, who's the director of the retina division at the Wilmer Eye Institute and has also uh, run a very productive and successful uh, clinical and laboratory-based research programs. He's also the former chair of an NEI study section, and so he has a very high-level understanding about grant writing and the review process. And he's gonna be telling us a little bit about the Wilmer Grant Review Committee as a potential uh, uh, mechanism uh, or tool that may be useful to other uh, institutions. Uh, great. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, sorry. After all these years of COVID, I uh, this format looks a little bit different from what I'm used to. Um, so, uh, Tom and and Cindy, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. I think this is a really informative uh, session this morning. I've been tasked with talking about the Wilmer uh, Grant Review uh, Committee, and so the realities of Wilmer's environment, as, as as Harry sort of alluded to, he's put together really a fantastic K-12 program that's been highly successful. Uh, we also have orchestrated a Wilmer K committee, which he alluded to, where we uh, uh, assess each mentee's research program and also critically assess each K mentor's involvement and submit a formal critique to both the mentee mentor and also to Peter McDonald so he can keep tabs on us. Um, the reality, on the other hand, we have a lot of experience uh, uh, faculty who are uh, interested in, in mentoring, but research time is stretched thin, as we all know, and faculty are not compensated for mentoring. Um, so um, we developed a grant review committee, which was developed really uh, as part of, I took a number of years ago, I took this wonderful course called the Master Mentor Course to learn how to be a better mentor. And at the year-long conclusion of this course, the, uh, we were, each person was tasked with developing a mentoring program in their respective departments. And I chose, since my passion is to keep the clinician scientist alive, was to develop a, a grant review committee to help improve the funding rates. So the goal obviously is to improve funding rates of grant proposals for um, younger faculty members. And I think the key uh, things that I thought about was to evaluate the research idea before the grant is written. I'll get into that. Uh, to provide some meaningful grant writing direction beyond what the mentor provides as an outside critique, and to provide objective critique of the grant proposal itself on which improvements can be made before the proposal is submitted to the funding agency. And we've encouraged all assistant professors, and we've had um, associate and full professors participate in what as well. So um, I think what's really helpful in thinking about this committee and when you're writing grants is is really uh, to think about what makes a grant fundable and really the buzzword is always impact. And so what is impact? And the way I think about it is in three, three sort of parts. By addressing the hypothesis, will the proposed research change how people think about the chosen topic? That's impact. Secondly, do the proposed aims interrogate the hypothesis? So any tangential experiments which don't directly uh, attack the hypothesis won't address the hypothesis, thus the impact gets reduced. And lastly, is the scope of work appropriate? Uh, if you propose too little research, it's going to fail to fully integrate the hypothesis. If you propose too much research, you won't get around to completing all of the experiments, and so you're going to not achieve uh, the aims of what you need to do and the 
uh, impact is going to be reduced. This is also a buzz term that we oftentimes see on grant reviews of the overambitious grant, which is frequently a grant killer. So our grant review committee, how does it work? Um, what happens is the mentee or the grant writer will identify a research idea, rationale for the project and a hypothesis and comes to me, will identify three experts uh, to serve on the committee and review the grant. Now, what this means for the committee members is really a three to four hour obligation over six months. So we have an initial one hour meeting and then toward the grant deadline, there's a two to three hour critique of the grant uh, proposal where they uh, review it NIH style. So at the initial one hour meeting with uh, where the, the, the grant applicant will present to the committee members and the mentor, there's it's about a 10, uh, 15 to 20 minute pre presentation of the research idea, presenting the underlying rationale, the hypothesis, the aims, uh, what they think are significant or innovative and a brief outline of the approach. And then the remaining uh, discussion focuses on really determining impact. So uh, what the bottom line is, does the committee think uh, the idea is, uh, is a fundable idea? Um, and uh, discussion also will uh, sort of pivot to optimizing the research idea, suggesting research directions, focusing on the, the central idea, and uh, a, a discussion on uh, suggesting uh, needed uh, pilot data. Um, the whole idea is we want to make sure that the idea is worth uh, an applicant spending four or six months writing. Uh, if they don't have a fundable idea, um, it's not worth spending the time. Um, so after that committee meeting, then we, the mentee starts writing the grant. We suggest that they uh, solidify the specific aims page, um, since many grants are sort of decided after uh, reviewers read the specific aims page and then um, move on to the approach uh, and then uh, finish up with the other su uh, suggestions. I offer the opportunity to critique each section along the way. Um, with really providing understandable writing, making sure the writing is clear so that um, one can understand what you're trying to accomplish in the grant. And as some advice that was given to me a number of years ago, you write a grant to the least smart reviewer to make sure that everybody can understand. I'd like to provide some grantsmanship tips that I learned sitting on study section uh, and from my own experience writing grants, um, and also to keep people on task. I think it's very important that make, uh, make one make sure that the aims address the hypothesis. And I think that's important to keep going back over to make sure that you're staying focused and on task. And also to make sure that the proposed work is, uh, the scope is appropriate. I also suggest that uh, the applicant write one aim at a time so that we can critique it before they move on to make sure that the old structure and the approach is on target. So we, we asked that um, the applicants um, finish writing the grant one or two months before the deadline so that the reviewers or the committee members can then review the grant NIH style. We asked that they return the grant within one week. Um, and it's uh, all of the elements that you see on a formal NIH review uh, to make comments. Now, if the if the grant writer is not meeting the deadline, then a full review may not be uh, may, may not be feasible, just the realities of life. Um, the mentee and the mentor receive the critiques and um, that hopefully will provide some valuable critiques to make changes before submitting the grant. So lessons learned from this whole process, I think the biggest emphasis is start writing the grant early. We recommend a six month period. Um, this is particularly important for clinician scientists because um, I don't know about you, but um, I always seem to have more emergencies or other obligations when I'm grant writing, or at least it feels that way. So you want to make sure you have enough time to, uh, to overcome these barriers that come along the way as you're writing the grant. And really use of the committee is, uh, is dependent on how early the mentee initiates the committee's help. Um, the uh, the the if you start early, you can also sort of figure out um, what pilot data that you need to do. And my observations, needing to get appropriate pilot data delays the grant construction or the submission. And we oftentimes find that 
pilot data the you know is really needed uh, to support the conceptual feasibility of a grant or uh, to show technical feasibility. And sometimes these ideas come up after the aims and the approach have been uh, initiated, just greater insight uh, emerges after one really thinks about the problem. Um, and we also suggest that you work closely with the mentor to set up deadlines to make that uh, to make sure you stay on task and that each of the sections get completed in a timely fashion. Um, so really, I think really taking advantage of all these experienced researchers is really helpful. Uh, it's interesting. We have uh, at Wilmer. I went back and looked at all the the people who went through the committee, and 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 really over eight years, only five uh, K mentees have gone through the entire process where they've gotten the reviews. It's a hundred percent success rate. Uh, there's a bit. There is a bit of a fall off for those who don't go through the entire process and 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 take advantage of what the expertise of the committee members have. So I, I really encourage people to go through the whole thing. It really can work. And I, I wish uh, everybody good luck in their uh, in, in their endeavors. Thank you so much, Jim. I know we really appreciate all your effort in organizing the Garrett Reiner Committee. I certainly know I've benefited from it. Um, next, we have Dr. Akrit Sodi, who is the Brana and Irving System Line Associate Professor of Ophthalmology in the Retina Division. He's a very successful clinician scientist who went through the NEI K08 program and is now independently funded. He'll discuss the transition from um, K grants to R grants. Sorry about that. I just had to unmute and then call put it back on. Thank you so much for, for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to participate. I was given the um, the topic of K to R transition, which is a little bit more nebulous than I think the other topics. Uh, so I set out to sort of put together five steps um, that would guarantee you transition from a K award to an R award. Um, and then, you know, thinking about it, everyone sort of starts off at a different place. You know, some people are doing clinical research, some people are doing basic science, there are MD, PhDs, there are people who have no research experience. And I thought, well, it's sort of silly to try to come up with five steps that would lead to a K to R transition. Um, however, I did come up with six steps, and that seemed much more reasonable. So I'll go ahead and share those with you. Um, so one of the questions that's often asked um, from K awardees is when should we start thinking about the K award to R transition? When should we start writing the, the R award? And the, the answer, quite honestly, is earlier, earlier than you think, earlier than you did. Um, fortunately, the, the way that the K award is designed, you've already started the process, even though you may not be entirely aware. Um, when you write a good K award, your mentors you know, ultimately may end up being your co-investigators or co-PI, your uh, education plan ends up being your um, areas of expertise. Your research plan um, doesn't necessarily um, have to flow into what you do in your R award, but it does provide the foundation uh, and the um, research expertise that you'll need in order to transition from the uh, K award to the R award. So I encourage all K awardees to start talking about the R award with their mentors when they're writing their grant. Is this a grant that will teach me what I need to do in order to get an R award? Are we thinking about things like impact, like um, novelty? Are we thinking about feasibility? Are we thinking about the key things that are looked at when someone uh, who doesn't have a, an R award applies for the first R award? Uh, and it's important that your mentor, in addition to helping you with your science, uh, is also considering that transition from the very beginning. And it's important that you bring it up to them so that they um, they also keep that in the back of their mind. So step two um, is focalize. So I don't know if any of you have heard of um, Jean-Marc Servija. Show, show of hands. Um, so... Now, which makes sense. He was a postdoc in my lab. He's not particularly famous, but he always used to use the word focalize uh, whenever he would talk to us about research. Um, and at the time, I thought he made the word up. He was from, uh, ironically, Barcelona, um, which he was talking about earlier in the um, meeting. Um, and you know, a lot of what he was saying, um, a lot of the words he used, he made up. So I thought this was one of them. But this is a real word, focalize, and it's to focus. And I, I do think it's something that a lot of 
new researchers um, have some difficulty doing. There's a lot of things you discover early. There's a lot of avenues to pursue. And um, I think it's sometimes hard to set aside some of those paths to focus on one, potentially two, that will be your main effort. And I, I do think that's critical. It's critical, critical for you to have the discipline to do that. And it's critical for your mentor to make sure you have the discipline to do that. Um, when I was doing my graduate work at the NIH, the, um, the director of the NIH was Harold Varmus, and he used to give a talk to graduate students. It was the same one he would give every year, and I would attend every year, and he would talk about the steps where people, postdocs, learn to become better scientists, and he, you know, some of the earlier steps I'll skip, but he, you get to the point where you have ideas um, that a year later, six months later, end up in nature cell, and you say to yourself, okay, I've I've got it. I, I have nature and cell ideas, you know, or New England Journal, if you do clinical research, I'm, I figured it out. I'm going to be a good scientist. And his point was that that's not, that doesn't predict you're going to be a good scientist. Um, everyone has nature cell ideas. Some of you have had them, you know, during the course of the two hours of this meeting. The key isn't coming up with a nature cell idea. The key is knowing which of those ideas you have the expertise to pursue. And that's the one you should pursue while the others you should set aside. That's challenging. A lot of people have difficulty making that distinction. And that's something your mentor needs to help you with while you're trying to uh, focus on one particular avenue to pursue. So step three, uh, channel your inner MacGyver. So some of you may, may not really understand what that means. And before I explain, I just like to explain what it doesn't mean. If this is the face of MacGyver that pops into your head, this pretty boy, this is not MacGyver. So just ignore that. It's Richard Dean Anderson, the original MacGyver. So when I say channel your inner MacGyver, during your K-Award, you, you have this unique opportunity to build all sorts of tools, tools that you can then use when you do your R-Award or you apply for your R-Award. Um, you should be taking advantage of that opportunity, whether it's expertise um, in terms of statistics or it's novel animal models or it's um, you know, unique you know, organoids. Um, or stem cell research, you need to develop expertise that will lead to things like impact and innovation that you can then put into your R grant. And you should always be thinking about, you know, how is this approach, how can I make it unique or make it better so that when I eventually do transition to a, an R award, it'll have that impact. It'll be looked at as being innovative. Uh, you don't have many opportunities while you're on an R award to come up with very novel um, models or approaches, uh, your K award does lend itself to that. So I would um, encourage you to be thinking of building a big tool set. And it's important if you focus on one topic um, to build tools that allow you to study that one topic. Um, so the next step, step four, uh, and Jim sort of uh, alluded to this is read, write, revise, and repeat. Your first idea, if you you write a, a, a specific aims page, or at least your initial hypothesis, and you spend a great deal of time polishing it. You spend like a few you know, weeks or months before you give it to someone. Um, you are gonna be very reluctant to listen to their feedback. You have to be willing to recognize that your first draft and your final draft are gonna be totally different. Your hypothesis might be similar, but you, you should be open to revisions. And that will mean reading a lot, which is, I think, critical um, when you start thinking about applying for an R award, what's new, what's known, what's not known, what's been published before, um, and what, what are the unanswered questions. And those can help you throughout your K award in guiding you towards a good project. So read all the time, write ideas, and revise them and keep repeating that. And along the way, seek critical feedback. Uh, and I know some of you see this is step 4B and I kind of cheated. I said there's gonna be six steps, but that's, you're gonna have to live with that. Um, you can use Jim's um, committee as one opportunity, but you want criticism. If you get, uh, you know, if you write your K award or your, excuse me, your R award specific aims page and you hand it to someone, your mentor or a colleague, and they tell you it's awesome, you know, you are wonderful. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you more confident. It has a lot of positive impact on you. It does 
absolutely nothing for your, um, your R application. You want to improve your application, you need someone to be critical. So be open to criticism and seek criticism. You don't have to listen to the criticism, but at least hear it out and try to understand why you know, that criticism exists and what you can do to improve it. Step five, publish or perish. And um, this is sort of the research equivalent, especially for a new investigator as um, sort of for real estate, uh, the concept of location, location, location. Uh, for a new investigator, it's feasibility, feasibility, feasibility. Um, you can say you're going to do something all you want. You can even show preliminary data that suggest you can do something. But if you publish a paper, and it doesn't have to be a cell paper or a New England Journal paper, but if you can publish a paper showing that you've done it before, that you have the expertise, that the model, the novel model you have, you've characterized, whatever it might be, if you have published it, that, that reassures the reviewers that you're capable of doing what you're suggesting. The, the biggest hurdle that new investigators have is proving to the study section that they can do what they're suggesting they will do. A lot of people have very good ideas, very good grant applications. They're well-written, um, but it gets um, poor, poorly scored in part because the committee isn't sure that they can actually do what they, they say they're gonna do. And this is a reasonably skeptical group of individuals that are reviewing your grant. So if you can publish a paper or two demonstrating feasibility, that goes a long way. My final um, piece of advice to everyone, and I always tell this to people whenever I give advice, which is not um, frequently, is you do you. Um, people's advice for you is motivated by two things. It's motivated by things that make themselves feel better about their own decisions. Like I might say, do basic science research, become an academic researcher, because that's the decision I made. Um, and sometimes it's motivated by things where it didn't work out, you know, try not to do too much clinic because it'll take your focus away um, from your research or, you know, try not to do clinical and basic science at the same time, whatever it might be. The truth is my failures don't predict your failure. Um, so if I wasn't able to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be able to do something. So take the advice, listen to people, um, but you do you, you decide whether or not you want to pursue, you know, what it is you had in mind. And if I tell you that just won't work, uh, and you think, you know what, awkward's wrong, I think it will, you go for it. And better yet, t tell me, you know, what I did to fail and then do it differently. Um, you should look at your mentors, not as people who can write a plan for you or a set of steps, uh, that can allow you to be, you know, Dr. X 2.0, uh, you want someone who can guide you to be the best uh, researcher that you can be, which ideally and most likely will be better than your mentor. And that should be your goal. Um, my case, it wasn't, but that, that's a different story. But um, I, I think that you, you really ought to try to do your best to follow what you think is best for you. So that's the end of, and those of you who haven't seen Napoleon Dynamite, you should watch the movie as well. Uh, that's my um, two cents. Uh, feel free to ignore. <laughs>